Good evening and welcome to Naples United Church of Christ in, here in Naples, Florida. My name is Dawson Taylor and I have the pleasure of serving on this clergy team as well as senior minister of this great church. I am joined this evening by my colleagues as well as friends, Reverend Dr. Deb Kaiser Cross, our Minister for Congregational Care, and Reverend Dr. Sharon Harris Ewing, our Assistant Minister. As we continue our Minister's uh, Clergy Roundtable discussion on the book, How uh, Forgive to Live, How Forgiveness Can Save Your Life, by Dr. Dick Tibbetts with Steve Halliday, PhD. I want to let you know, even though this is our third week uh, of this discussion, that we still have copies of the book uh, available in the church office. And if you wish to order one, please feel free to email books at naplesucc.org, or you can call the church office and speak to our receptionist, Chelsea. We'll be glad to get you one. The cost is $20, and that includes any um, mailing costs uh, to have it mailed to you. This book was brought to us by Deb, uh, who had it suggested to her by one of our Stephen ministry leaders, and I hope that you'll express um, certainly our gratitude, because um, I have found this book really um, engaging, and, and even in, in some of this section, really had some personal aha moment, moments that we will um, certainly get to. And so tonight, uh, we engage in our third session, as I mentioned earlier, um, which is, uh, includes chapters 6 through 8, which is, includes pages 103 to 142, if you're following along or reading along. And so before we jump into tonight's material, I just thought I would take a moment because, uh, again, I feel like last week's material was a little more dense, if you will, than perhaps this week's. Um, and I just wanted to do a check-in to see if there's anything that you wanted to either touch base on, wrap up, or if you had any concluding thoughts that perhaps we didn't get to last week. I just wanted to touch base and see if there was anything. I don't have anything in particular. I feel like we just barely got into his concept of the grievance story, but yeah. that comes up in these chapters and in the following chapters, so I don't think we need to say more except as it unfolds. Yeah, in, uh, in chapter eight uh, this evening, you know, he does, I think, a really great job of talking about reframing the story. He has these great visual images about literally um, framing and how we do that. So yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that, I, I think it was Deb, you said this, that the, um, the framing, or the grievance story rather, is uh, really the central, yeah. one of the central themes of the book, which I, I agreed with. You know, I think what I've been thinking about, and I'm not sure it's as much from last week as much as just pondering the wholeness of yeah. the book, is that I realized that I thought I had let go of things, mm -hmm. but I had not chosen to forgive, which we're going to talk right. about tonight. Um, they just kind of are left there, kind of left them behind, but they impact me more than I realize. Mm -hmm. And this book has really helped with that. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that some more tonight. Yeah, I think so. And just to make sure I'm thinking about it clearly. Um, so what I hear you saying is that you perhaps thinking that you had more actively forgiven than maybe you had, but instead, you had simply just kind of let it be. Let it be, forget about it. Yeah. Uh, just move on. Yeah. As opposed to actively forgiving. Which, which is, I say, yeah, and tonight. he really talks about, I can't remember which chapter, but um, he really talks about that, that, you know, forgiveness is a decision. Absolutely. Versus, you know, kind of walking away from it. And I can't remember who, which of the two of you said it, but one of you last week talked about the fact that, um, Sharon, I think it was you when you said that you really sometimes would let decisions or let um, things happen and, and not deal with it so that you didn't have to have that conflict, that you could, you know, let it rest and not worry about it, which I think a lot of us do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, but he does talk about that forgiveness is an intentional decision, which um, I wholeheartedly agree with. But again, he gives uh, step by step 
kind of how-tos, which I really uh, mm -hmm. appreciate. So with that in mind, let's uh, dive in. Chapter six is entitled, Forgiveness is a Choice. He uh, starts off the chapter, he tells a, an amazing story um, about the Holocaust um, and about forgiveness, and, and that's a powerful story that I recommend to you if you're reading along. And then he quotes several thought leaders. Um, I thought the one by Napoleon Bonaparte was uh, interesting when Napoleon said, nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than to be able to decide. And again, I think this idea about the decision to forgive is so crucial. Um, he writes on page, Dr. Tibbetts writes on page 105, the freedom to choose, the power of choice, confronts you every time you are wronged. Will you choose blame or will you choose forgiveness? Will you hand over the reins of your life to someone you don't even like? Or will you decide to direct the path of your own future? What will you choose? And so as I was thinking about that, I will tell you what really struck me was, will you hand over the reins of your life to someone you don't even like? So have you ever handed over the reins of your life, even, even, you know, even if only temporarily, uh, to someone you don't even like to direct the path uh, of your own future? And if you're willing, would you share maybe an example? Or if you want to name names, that's fine. But uh, you know, to, to share an example about that. I want, before we get to that yeah. question, to, to say um, two things that are sort of um, prior comments to sure. me. One is um, this notion of people you don't even like. Mm -hmm. Because that phrase comes up a number of times, and every time I read it, I stumbled over it because, yes, there are times that I've been angry or hurt by someone I don't like, but as I think I have said before, the people who have the greatest power to hurt me or to make me really angry are the people closest to me because mm -hmm. I have a different expectation. And so it was kind of like, well, no, I'm not worried about those people I don't like. Yeah, it's I am. To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but so, so for me, that was, that was yeah. to imply that those are the, if we have somebody we have to forgive, it must be somebody we don't like, leaves out a whole big part yeah. of the, the group of people that I need to wrestle with because they're the ones that, that, um, that has the most effect on me. And he talks about that later and we will talk about that later because that was a, a significant aha moment for me is part of what happens in those moments uh, when we experience that type of uh, hurt is this... Uh, uh, tension between uh, trying to understand why people that we love or that we have relationship with would hurt us. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, just which goes back to your your starting point, I think that's really an important and overarching theme of the book is this notion of our own choices and controlling our our own lives. Yeah. Um, and we think of that in other areas perhaps, but not necessarily in terms of these one-on-one um, -on -one relationships and things like forgiveness, but I, I found myself thinking that's one of the significant takeaways of the book for me is the sense in which mm -hmm. when I make decisions, when I make the choice, then I'm claiming control and I keep myself mm -hmm. from being the victim, I keep myself from you know, giving the reins to somebody mm -hmm. I like or don't like or whatever, right. so. Which um, really goes back to the grievance story, right? You know, it's really about how we, how we tell, how we mm -hmm. frame the grievance story. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I had to go back and really think about it because you raise a really important question. The, the story that I'm gonna share is not a person I liked as much as I respected her position. Mm -hmm. And so, because I respected her position, I was hurt by what she did. Mm -hmm. And what I hear you saying is that you respected her position, but not necessarily her as a person. Not after, sure. after some experience. Yeah. So, so the story goes like this. I was getting my degree in counseling. This was a person who was in the counseling field who um, saw herself somehow as mentoring me. Um, and I allowed it to some degree. Uh, 
but as time went on, I found that she found her, she liked to be one up. You know, that mm -hmm. whole concept of people either are one up on you or one down, but not an equal. Mm -hmm. Because she could never take the, the next step from being one up to a, equal colleagues. And so she continued to kind of put me in my place. Mm -hmm. And I allowed that to run through my mind until I realized what was going on and said, no more, let it go. Um, let take her voice out of my mind because that's where the grievance story begins for mm -hmm. me, is letting those voices of her kind of putting me down to, um, to, to just say, I, I don't need to listen to those voices. So that's, that was mine. And how did you feel that she had the reins of your life or control of your I life? I listened to her voice yeah. too much. And I started second guessing myself yeah. and feeling like, am I really adequate in this role? And as time went on, I realized this had so much more to do with her issues yeah. than my own. And it, but it took me time to wake up to it and took me time to then forgive later because mm -hmm. I allowed her to um, be in my brain too long. Yeah. I find that um, in my life uh, where I have struggled with this, and again, this is a, an I statement, uh, is that I have struggled uh, with dating because you know when you're in a relationship or you, you think you're headed toward a relationship, and then when it's when you're not, you know, when that's either ended or the the potential for that relationship to grow ends, um, for a long time, I would allow that person who I was no longer in relationship with to, you know, really dictate so many things from a distance. And I mm -hmm. realized, you know, that I was still making decisions um, or still wanting to be perceived in ways that would either impress or um, perhaps have an impact or my perception that it would have an impact on that person <laughs> from a distance, you know, and, and again, this, I, this, you know, completely dysfunctional idea that I would uh, determine what they would think from a long way away, you know, or that frankly, I could ever you know, either change what they think or change their perception. But, you, you know, you begin to realize, you know, with, with healthier thinking and with uh, self-awareness and things, A, even if you're in a relationship that that's not healthy thinking, but then it's really not healthy thinking if you're no longer in a relationship, you know? And so, I, to me, that image of having control of my life or having the reins of my life, I began to realize uh, the kind of control that I was handing over to yeah. someone else. And frankly, someone I didn't like any longer <laughs> because of the pain that had been caused. Right. But at one time had been someone that I did like. So I, I mean, I can agree with, I can certainly hear and agree with what you're saying, Sharon. Well, the, the example that came to my mind was not so much turning over the reins as letting someone go on and keep hurting. And it wasn't just me, it was, um, this was when I was in an administrative role at the college, and um, one of my faculty colleagues had pretty serious mental health issues, and I think out of that um, acted out and said a lot of inappropriate and hurtful things to other colleagues or to students. Um, and not just me, kind of all of us let it go on mm -hmm. much too long. Um, finally, there was an event that directly involved me. It was extremely hurtful to me, but that meant it also gave me the opportunity to be the one to deal with it. Mm. And um, I, as I look back on it, I think... We really did those steps of assertive um, responding in, in the sense of um, confronting the problem and naming it and, and identifying what the consequences were if um, you know behaviors didn't change and things. But it was more, it's just not easy no. to confront mm -hmm. somebody who is hurting other people. And so it took, um, it took too long, mm -hmm. but, but I did feel good that in the end we, we were able to do it. Um, and kind of, as you were saying earlier, Deb, I, I don't know that I ever thought about did I 
forgive her. It was more, <clears throat> we, we managed to rein in the behavior and, and that was sort of where I let it, let right. it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, Deb, I agree. I think you raised such an important point um, at, right at the outset is that uh, there's such a distinct difference between dealing with it and uh, actively forgiving versus leaving it to the side, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I just, uh, you've given, you've given me a lot to think about and for which I'm mostly grateful. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do think, and, and again, I think Tibbetts is making this point, particularly in this section um, about, again, this chapter being uh, entitled forgiveness is a choice. Um, you know, I mean, it almost feels like too, that it could be entitled forgiveness is a decision. You know, mm -hmm. when we think about, there is a distinct difference between not dealing with something right. versus making the decision, you know, to, to forgive. Uh, on page 106, he, he outlines this kind of three-step process, you know, once you make that decision, that there's the stimulus, which, again, I think each of us in our stories identify that there is that, that final, if you will, straw that breaks the camel's back. There's the reflection and then there's the response. And it makes me wonder, again, carrying this theme of uh, making that decision to forgive, if sometimes that we stall between reflection and response. We reflect on it, we realize, um, you know, that what pain has happened to us or what, what pain exists, and yet we don't, we haven't responded. And as I was reading that, I thought about the adage that says, you know, we cannot control what happens to us, but we can control how we respond to it. Um, you know, he is, uh, Tibbetts and, and Halliday um, are the masters of lists. <laughs> and that's why I'm grateful for our expanded technological abilities because, you know, we have the ability to list these off for people. So some of the lists I included, some I did not. But he talks about the elements of choice. Uh, the first being intentionality about a desired result. The second is the belief that the goal is attainable. Third, the action, or actions that make your intentions reality. Fourth, the desire to minimize internal conflict with core values and competing desires. And fifth, consideration of the impacts your current actions will have on your future goals. And I, I, the reason I included that list in particular was thinking about this idea that if you get frozen in that idea between reflection and response, that there's reason to continue it, that you can think about these lists. I, I was particularly um, struck by the consideration, the, the fifth one, consideration of the impacts your current actions will have on your future goals. Had you not confronted the colleague, had you not confronted the colleague in a different setting, if I had not confronted my own behavior, um, how each of those can impact you know, the future and how we see our, our, our actions and how it can impact, frankly, our happiness. Um, go ahead. I, I think the, the um, consideration of the impacts, though, and how to minimize internal conflict, part of the choice is when to respond and when not, and there's a not responding that's avoidance, and there's, there's also a not responding, which is, this isn't worth my time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we know people who take umbrage at the smallest little slight and want to deal with it. And I guess I want to be the person who chooses, I don't want to say battles because in the context of forgiveness, it's not a battle, but I want to choose when there is sufficient hurt, when it makes, when I need to for my own health and for the relationship, um, and when I can let it go. I mean, it, it's not... It doesn't even require forgiveness because it doesn't rise to that level of, of hurt or, or something. But I don't what if, because um, I'm hearing you're assuming you have to do it with the other person. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of those things, I don't have to do with the other person. I just have to do it internally. Okay. Uh, because I, I think the things that hurt me, but don't, but it's my stuff. I recognize mm -hmm. it's my stuff. I need to forgive and let it go. And sometimes I have to deal with the other person. Mm -hmm. 
And I was thinking too, it's interesting, when you, when you were speaking, where my mind went was also the appropriate time. Right. Mm. If there is, because I mean, let's be honest, sometimes in, forgive, in forgiveness work, there is confrontation to be had. It doesn't mean that it has to be in your face confront, uh, confrontation. It just simply means, you know, you might feel the need to say, you know, this was deeply hurtful to me and I, I need to address this. Um, I think that sometimes people have this um, overinflated need to do it in some grand, uh, right. grandiose or dramatic way, in part because sometimes that hurt is so deep, and so there's this you know need to really react to that, and that's where I often want to mm-hmm. say to people, yeah, that's just not the place to do this. Right, and, and, and in later yeah. chapters he talks about timing, but I, I just have to tell you this funny experience when you you say Deb that sometimes you need to forgive, but you don't need to tell them about it. One of the strangest experiences that I had, I was in a Presbyterian church where I served briefly as a part-time interim person. And um, I was also a part of the church and, and um, knew lots of people. And there was a time, one Sunday, like in a fellowship hour, this dear older woman, and I was younger then, <laughs> came up to me, and I'll just never forget this. She was like, I just want to tell you that I forgive you. And I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> she never told me what I had she done to never, hurt her. Ever? It was just, it was like she needed to say to me that she forgave me, and I, I'm, I was gracious, but it was a very strange experience yeah. because for the life of me, I could not figure out what I had done that was such that she needed to forgive me, but I was forgiven. It was... Sometimes it's just good to know that you've been forgiven. That's right. I guess. That's right. Although, that would drive me crazy. Um, actually, I think this, uh, the second list is very connected to what we were just talking about. Um, and and, and Tibbetts talks about in this section about which road looks better. Um, and I kept thinking about, you know, the higher road, uh, so to speak. But uh, he, it's just a three... Uh, three item list is this hurtful experience worth sacrificing my peace of mind Uh, secondly how much space am I willing to set aside in my mind for this person I do not even like (laughs) maybe that's what I'm drawn to is the list that (laughs) and then thirdly am I sufficiently focused on my life goals so as not to allow this event to distract me from what is truly important and again, I, I, I do think there is this idea of, of prioritizing, like mm-hmm. where does this fall in my list? You know, and I've heard this from time to time and, and there's a sermon that I wanna preach on it someday, but you know, is this a five minute problem, a five mm-hmm. hour problem or a five year problem type you know, thing? And, and I do think sometimes that's a really important question for all of us to ask of ourselves and potentially the systems in which we work. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's easy to... Well, and in the spirit of that we do sometimes need to respond, what happens if that five-minute problem, we don't take those five minutes, mm. it, it may grow, and that becomes that grievance story that gets told over and over, so it right. becomes a five-hour problem or whatever, and, and sometimes it's worth taking the five minutes so it's over and done with. Yeah. No, I I completely agree. And on page uh, 110, uh, Dr. Tibbetts writes, forgiveness is always an option. In the end, you'll make good choices and bad choices throughout your life, everyone does. But when you make a bad choice, you can always go back and review it. Um, And again, I was struck by the forgiveness is always an option. Have you ever needed to reconsider a choice about not forgiving someone? What did you decide and how did you feel after? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like, I mean, even though I designed that question, I was kind of thinking to myself, mm, yeah, like every day. Yeah, well, I, I'm th- I was thinking one, and, and that's why this book has actually been super helpful for me because there's this one person that I um, kind of, I, it's not that I decided not to forgive. I just decided to say it's 
it's not worth it and she's not worth it, which yeah. I, I hate to even admit saying a person is not worth it. But I just, that's what I did because I didn't think it would make a difference. I didn't think she would um, choose to respond in a positive way. Um, but this book has made me realize that me putting that aside at, was really unhealthy for me. And it's not that I necessarily have to reconcile with her or even talk to her about it, but I do need to forgive her. And I think that forgiveness... Um, will allow me to see her and not feel like there's stuff that's between us. Yeah. And it, that's, for me, one of the key factors in forgiveness. I know I've completely forgiven someone when I can think about her or that situation and not get roiled, like embroiled in it again. Yeah. So. I think there's such vulnerability in forgiveness. You know, because I think about uh, a particular situation in which I've done some significant work on my own um, to forgive someone. And I would, I would like, you know, as I reiterated, I think it was our first session, that, you know, forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. Because, and I harp on that because I, it's really important to me that people understand that so that they don't feel that they have to run out and be back in relationships with people that cause great harm to them. But um, I feel like I could be back in relationship with this person. It's a professional relationship. But there's such vulnerability in, in going to this person and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I forgive you for what you did and, and how you acted. And it doesn't mean that I have no responsibility, but in the midst of my work, I'm pretty hard pressed to tell you what I what I did in the middle of it. I'm again, I'm not, you know, completely innocent in all of it. But I think part of that, what keeps me from being able to really engage in that dialogue, is the vulnerability of knowing that this person could say, "I don't need your forgiveness. I don't need to be back in a relationship with you. That's not of interest to me." And the deep pain that that could cause mm -hmm. me. And so I, I think about, as I was thinking about this work that he outlines, thinking, boy, there's just a lot of vulnerability in that. In a, in a later chapter, he talks about the fact that um, you, you, you can choose what you're going to do, but you can't script how the person's going to respond. And yeah. I think you're right that that's part of where the vulnerabil vulnerability lies because there's the risk that they're going to say something back that hurts you again. Right, yeah. And feeling like, I mean, in some ways, in, in my world, it feels like giving them the power, uh, the reins, as Tibbet says earlier, to do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's like, oh, that person had the reins for a long time, and I'm not sure I want to yep. give them the reins back. I was just thinking about 12-step work, and that's like the steps eight and nine, and about um, being willing to make amends um, except when to do so would hurt others. Yeah. And um, it, it, there is a, there's a cost, and there's a measuring of that cost. Right. But I do think you're right about the humility of it and the vulnerability, because even being willing to go and have a conversation with somebody who's hurt you deeply or you've hurt, we can't predict the outcome. Right. But wow, I've seen when people have done it and the power on the other side is amazing. Yeah, it's palpable. It I mean, really it real, is. Yeah. Even when there's been no response. Like I, I can think of one of my dear friends who went to an, uh, a sibling alienated from and tried to make amends and the other person just was not interested. Mm -hmm. But the person was able to let it go then. Yeah, it is, I think, in some ways, or in many ways, it's about trusting yourself um, and trusting God that you are doing the work that you need to do. Right. And, and, and again, not giving that person, whether you like them or not, not giving them the reins, again, over your life or having that say um, yeah. over your life. 
uh, again, Tibbetts goes on to write, you may not always have had the ability or even been in circumstances that allowed you to make good choices. Um, as an example, he writes, as a child, for instance, you were tied to your parents and did not always have the opportunity to make healthy choices. And this reminded me of some work um, that, I've, that I've done, particularly in the LGBTQ community, where sometimes um, people have complex relationships or uh, perhaps more complex relationships with parents. Um, for whatever reasons, um, perhaps rejection or fear of rejection. And a colleague uh, a long time ago used to, uh, taught me a line that has been always helpful, and that is to say to people and to help people understand, your parents were the best parents they knew how to be. And it doesn't let anyone off the hook, it doesn't make excuses for people, but it allows people the freedom to perhaps, again, reframe. It, it allows the grievance story to take a different understanding or a different turn. Um, because again, as I was reiterating, I think in our last session, I just know that so much of what we understand comes from our early uh, experiences in life. Um, and then, of course, we are a church and uh, trying to always look at these uh, understandings through the eyes of faith and through the lens of, of our faith. And so I couldn't help but think of uh, in John 10, uh, when, when it says the thief comes, Jesus was saying the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so I think about when we choose forgiveness, knowing that it is the better choice that we live life and we live it with abundance. At least that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. So chapter seven, it's not easy to forgive, which I appreciate this chapter because I think Dr. Tibbetts does a, uh, an excellent job of reminding us that, and I think he does it in the right order, Forgiveness is the higher road, the better choice, but then acknowledging it's not easy to forgive. He's, uh, on page uh, 115, he says, but the greatest barrier to forgiveness is our inability to understand, this is why I was referencing Sharon, uh, to understand why someone would intentionally hurt us. So this was like that moment when I was reading, and, and in all fairness, I read differently and more um, focused in a more focused way when I know that I'm going to be facilitating the session. This was that like set the book down and go, oh wow, yeah, that's that's me because I think so often I give people the benefit of the doubt and then when that is taken from me, that's where I struggle with forgiveness. So did that speak to you? Was that not quite as impactful um, what, what was your response? I um, try really hard to look at the impact of the hurt versus the intent. Hmm. And I have always assumed, I think in the past, that people set out to intentionally hurt mm. um, in situations where I've been deeply wounded but the older I get, the more I realize it's not true. Mm -hmm. And that the most deeply hurtful experiences in my life came from a different, people's different lens. They either thought I had hurt them and they were reacting or, and most of the time that's what I think it is, is that they're reacting to me and whether I intentionally did it or not. And so when I can look at it in a bigger frame, I'm just think of the many people um, that I've experienced that with, the bigger the frame, the more I realize it, it probably wasn't as intentional as I thought it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I also think about when you were talking at first about the um, intention of the hurt and the impact of the hurt and how one is about the other person and one is about you. 
Yeah. And I just think about, or how it, how it was received by you. Sharon, what were your thoughts about this? Well, I, I do think um, that does speak to me. It's hard to understand. And again, and maybe I'm just unique. We're all unique. But I, for me... You're the, unique, it, just like everyone else. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do distinguish between people with whom I'm in a different relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's somebody close to me, yes, it's hard to understand why they would hurt me because they're supposed to love me. They're supposed to be treating me well. And so the more hurt I am, that's where you really get the other side of the coin, the more angry I am. How could you do this to me? Mm. Um, you know, you say you love me or, or whatever. Um, but for people who are um, out side of that closer circle, then it's a different question. It, it might be, was this intentional, or do they even have any idea that that would hurt me? Um, it, the other thing, and I think I've shared this before, um, it's not one of those things that I'm proud of, but my personality tendency is um, to assume fault. <laughs> And so um, part of the hurt anger piece is um, how easily I fall into, I must have done something wrong or what, how did I contribute to it? And, and so it gets all complicated. Yeah. Um, and I know that and I can say that. And when you're in the middle of it, it's not always so obvious or, or clear. But I think um, to the extent that we care appropriately for ourselves um, and we try to care for other people, then we do wonder why do people hurt each other? Mm -hmm. How do you, Sharon, manage the idea or the concept, um, which I believe so often to be true, which is those who are closest to us often hurt us the most because they know we're not going anywhere. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm not sure that uh, that I would end the because the same way. Mm -hmm. I think, um, see, I, I guess this makes me a fair, fair, fairly orthodox theologian. I take pretty seriously both um, the, the good in us and the, the sin in us. Um, I also think part of the reason that the people closest to us hurt us more is they know us and they know our weak spots, mm -hmm. and they know how to hurt yeah. in ways that other people don't, and that's the sin in us, and it may be out of their own hurt, out of their own fears. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's all kinds of reasons, probably, yeah. um, and... and, and it's also because we care about them, and sure. whether whether it's about going or not going, um, if a stranger insults me, you know, in the grocery store, um, I may think it's sort of out of place or inappropriate. Right. Um, it's not going to affect my sense of self and my sense of self worth if, even in an unintentional comment, yeah. someone I I love and respect insults me, then it, it just has a different, mm -hmm. um, a different feel to it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, as you were saying that, I thought, you know, that is so often though, I've experienced that and I have seen it happen to others. And I just was curious um, about that. Um, again, in, in chapter seven, he breaks down uh, two key characteristics that make forgiveness more likely to occur, humility and empathy. And since uh, David has retired and is not with us, I thought I would be the one to bring up the Latin. Um, and I'm trying to remember which book it was where we were dealing with this. I think that it was Barbara Brown Taylor's book before we changed to the Sacred Conversations model, but uh, where we talked about um, humility. And um, But anyway, humility comes from... Uh, the Latin humilitas, which is derived from uh, homos, referring to dirt or soil. And then this is where this was a wonderfully eye-opening experience for me. He says, 
Dirt can be seen either as the lowest thing on earth or as that from which all life springs. So for me, that line just brought wonderful memories of a, a dear friend. Um, she was my pastor's wife back in the 1990s in a Baptist church outside of Buffalo. Um, and she was a teacher and she did um, taught gifted students, but she was really into science and the environment and the earth. And she taught me, you don't say dirt, you say soil. Interesting. Because that, that's the richness yeah. and that, that sense of reverence for the earth. Um, you know, dirt just implied bad things and uh -huh. soil um, the richness. And, and so I couldn't read that without um, thinking about her. And yes, I mean, the earth is where we come from, where we live. I mean, it's our yeah. home. Yeah. I just loved that uh, image, though, of, of, of our choice of how we look at it uh, and, and that we can choose. So for me, that was a new thought. I had light bulbs going off. Was it impactful for you at all, Deb? I had heard it before. Okay. So it wasn't um, really fresh, um, but a good reassurance. Yeah. Well, on page 116, he goes on to write, our need to feel important often stands in the way of humility. Now, I'm grateful that's not a struggle for me, but I realize that it might be for, <laughs> uh, for others. Um, but, I mean, do you, so have you ever struggled with that? Um, or the, I, I believe, the universal need to hide our flaws and failings to seem uh, more with it? and how we tell our grievance stories. Well, I will say, I, I go back to clinical pastoral education in like when I was 20, I don't know, whatever, early 20s, going through seminary, and I remember I was the youngest in the group, and I so desperately wanted to be seen as like having some wisdom or intelligence or whatever, and, um, I always felt like I just wasn't quite enough because everybody yeah. was older and much wiser than I was. And I remember in my final evaluation that my supervisor said, you don't have to try so hard, it will mm -hmm. come. Yeah. And that trying to be more than I was because yeah. I was so insecure at the time. So yeah, I resonate with that. And you know, it, it does take some years to kind of move out of that. Sure. I'm just curious how many women were in that CPE class, too? Uh, one, two, three of us. Okay. But two of them were nuns. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I was the only Protestant sense. woman. And yeah. in my CPE class, um, one of the people in the group was my New Testament professor. Wow. So oh, that made wow. for an interesting <laughs> yeah. experience. Yeah. He had decided that was something he wanted to do. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a human tendency. Um, I, I know my flaws and failings better than anybody else, and um, I am not, I don't feel any need to shout them from the rooftops <laughs> and tell <laughs> what they are. Um, I'm my own worst critic, and yeah. I know that. Um, so, um, it's, I would say something that is um, valuable and a growing um, edge for me to be a part of this clergy team that where there's a culture of valuing vulnerability um, and that's um, something I'm learning to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually had a, a phone call with a dear, dear friend, my college roommate, um, last week and I said, I really feel like um, it's a pretty amazing thing to be this old and working in um, this church with this team and to feel like I'm still growing mm -hmm. mm. and that that's really a gift. Yeah, that's um, true. And discussions like this, but you know, our clergy team meetings and, and the things that we do um, I, I know that I'm growing and I appreciate that. Yeah. 
I think, um, as Deb, as you referenced about your uh, CPE class, so often at this point in my life, and I know it won't last much longer, so I'm holding on to it as tightly as I can, but so often in a room of colleagues or um, leaders uh, at, at this time, I am very often the youngest in the room. And so I think for me, it is often about hiding or attempting to hide or disguise any, anything that might be perceived as a flaw or failing or how I would perceive a flaw or failing. And so, you know, again, that I think can come out in a grievance story or that can come out in how we frame things. And, and again, I think that is just written all over mm -hmm you know, any of our abilities sometimes to forgive or the decision to intentionally decide to forgive. Mm -hmm. you for, know, and for those who are familiar with the Enneagram, yes. it's fascinating to me to listen to each other since we know each other's types and how it shows up with our different personalities. Yeah. The, the difficulties with forgiveness are different based on personalities. Yeah. Well, I think there's that, and then, you know, I, I have increasingly am a, am, a, am a fan of Enneagram. I, I have often been a fan of birth order and, and how that impacts things, and, you know, and so yeah, thinking just, about some of those things. It's fun to kind of just yeah. watch it because how we respond is very different yeah. because of our different personalities. Yeah. Well, so. and you've talked in earlier weeks, um, and I think quite rightfully, and I thought about it at different points as I'm reading the book, about gender also being an issue. Yeah. So you, there's, yeah. there's so many, um, so many pieces. Yeah. Certainly. Uh, again, uh, Tibbetts goes on to write, humility is the ability to balance one's successes and accomplishments with one's failures and shortcomings, which I thought was helpful uh, writing. Humble people can recognize that under the right set of circumstances, they are quite capable of causing another person the kind of terrible hurt they themselves have experienced, which I, I think really resonates, Sharon, with so much of, of what you were saying. And uh, he goes on, how could anyone consistently say, I've made mistakes, I'm not perfect, and I'm thankful that someone has forgiven me and yet refused to extend the same courtesy to others. And then again, through the lens of, of faith, I was thinking um, and, and reflecting on this, and I wrote, you know, from the perspective of faith, we live and have our being in a faith perspective that says that Jesus came and was ultimately crucified so that all sins are forgiven. So how can we withhold forgiveness that has been given so freely to us by God through Jesus. And so again, this Christian you know, perspective and impact around forgiveness. So culturally, one-on-one, -on -one, we have been given it. And then from the faith perspective, we've been given it. And yet, so many of us hold on to it. Or, as we've talked about, we lay it aside and think, well, I'll deal with that later. And then it really begins to eat us up rather than what we hope is it eats the, the person we may not like up, but really what happens is it eats us up. Yep. This just took me back to the very first chapter where he talks about the myths of forgiveness right. and um, not forgiving because, well, that might mean that what the person did wasn't really that bad right? Mm -hmm. or that um, they would be getting off without any consequence um, or that it means I have to forget it and I don't want to forget it. I mean, it just, it, when I think, why don't we, I go back to some of those myths that he outlined in the very first yeah, chapter. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important reminder. And he reminds us again at the end of this chapter, I think it's this chapter, that, you know, and warns us that forgiveness, again, does not equal condoning the behavior, mm -hmm. um, which I do think we sometimes, again, I'll, you know, I think I can sometimes get caught up that, well, I don't want to condone that behavior. Well, it's not condoning, but it is about giving yourself the peace and and the freedom and modeling what's been modeled for you. Um, I loved this also about the second characteristic of empathy. Empathy means to feel into as opposed to sympathy, which means to feel with. And I, um, I, I that resonated also. Um, on the top of page 123, 
Dr. Tibbetts warns that we should never say, I know exactly how you feel. And I'm sure, Deb, with your, your therapeutic background, you, you know this, and, and I was taught this a while back, and I hear people say it, and I don't, I don't like jump in and start correcting people, but I always cringe a little when I hear people say, and let me tell you, the worst theology you can ever experience is to go into any store and go into the sympathy card section mm -hmm. because that is where all of this theology ends up. And it's, you know, uh, again, not to, to call you out, but like uh, on the death of your mother and I know how you feel as you grieve and I, I just, I can't do it because I don't. No, and, and I will say, you know, when I do grief groups, yeah. one of the, the sessions is on what are some of the things that people have said to you that have been meaningful, and what are the things that people have said to you that have driven you absolutely crazy? And at the very top of that second list is, I know exactly how you feel. Right. It is right. one of the least um, respectful things we can do, even though we're trying to be kind. You know, and he says, um, the exact nature and specific details of the events will vary from person to person, mm -hmm. but the resulting feelings will be similar. So he's not taking away from the fact that you can have a very similar experience mm -hmm. and have very similar feelings, but he reiterates, you will not know exactly how someone feels. And so I find, what are some things um, that in grief group or, or in therapy that what are some other phrases we might be able to use? I have no words for the pain you're feeling, but I stand with you. Yeah. I, I always say, because I like journey language, I always just say, I am with you on this journey, mm -hmm. um, and my heart is with you. Yeah. You know, because yeah. Yeah. so often I don't. I, you know, I haven't experienced what the person's experiencing, but I want them to know that it's a sincere wish that I'm with them. Do you have a kind of a go-to phrase or? No, I think, I mean, similar things in terms yeah. of, um, there are no words to say um, that will take this pain away, but you're in my heart and in my prayers and um, the, those kinds of, of messages of presence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think from a faith perspective that as people, and, and this is not as clergy, this is as people, um, we are ambassadors of God's presence. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so um, to try to communicate in some way that, that I'm hoping you will feel God through all of the people who love you mm -hmm. and are praying for you at yeah. this time. Um, you know, that kind of thing. yeah, and I will often say, you know, people will say, I just don't know what to say to them. And I'll say, say that, mm -hmm. you know, just say, I'm calling because my heart breaks <clears throat> and I don't know what to say. Yeah. And I often say, you will be amazed what that will mean to someone. Yeah. Yeah. And I well, will say, nobody has said any of those bad things to me. <laughs> yeah. okay, okay, okay. This whole congregation has been, yeah. they get it. They yeah. get how to be kind to people who are grieving. Yeah, I so, do think this congregation I, I just wanted to it. say that. I do want to dive into a little bit of, uh, I don't know, controversy, but I'm curious to see if I'm stirring something up here. On page 124, uh, Tibbetts has a, a section that's, uh, that's entitled, it's a, a, a section, not a chapter, but for the grace of God, and says that this is a concept of identifying with another person's situation is captured in the statement, there but the grace of God go I. Um, I struggle with that theology. I actually preached a sermon once uh, in my previous church um, about uh, this, the series was entitled Christian Clichés, and that was one that I chose to preach about because, and I, I didn't take the time to pull that sermon to look back at, at the theological grounding of it, but what I remember and what I believe about that is it feels to me like a superiority, mm -hmm. like when you say, there but the grace of God go I. Like, I'm better or potentially in a better place because you're going through that. And so that is one of those, mm. if you will, isms that I, so I struggled with him on this point. You know, I, I don't, 
unless it said a little like, you know how Southerners sometimes say, bless your heart? Yeah, oh, yeah. There, yeah. but by the grace of God go I. Yeah. That bugs me. But if I hear it from somebody I know who has gone through to hell and beyond and right. said, right now I'm just really grateful that I'm not there. I've been there, and I'm with you in this. So it, it, it's all in how it's sure, said so for me. Sure, so intent versus, yeah. Absolutely, and it's how it's said. Yeah. And it's interesting because I had a really different response. I don't hear the superiority in it. Mm -hmm. Part of the theology that I don't like that I hear in it is kind of the God who pulls strings. Mm. Mm. And if it weren't for yeah. God saving me, I might be in the position you're in. Yeah. Mm. And I don't think that's how God works. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think we might be saying very similar things just in different ways because that resonates with me. I mean, for me, it, 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 that idea, well, God kept that from happening to me. I'm sorry that yeah. it happened to you. Hmm. Um, what I can affirm about it is that there are circumstances beyond our control and that this bad thing that happened to you could have happened to me. That's, yeah. For reasons that... Neither of us will ever know. And why, you know, why it was that you were the one who was on the plane that crashed and I was the one who missed the plane that day. I don't think God, you know, pulled that string, but I understand that there, but for things beyond my understanding or control, that could have been me. And so that's the empathy of, mm -hmm. I realize I could be in that position Absolutely. and and I stand with you in that pain. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, you know, and, and again, I, in typical fashion, I agree with both of you and it, it helps me provide a different perspective because I do think that people who genuinely think through it, I, I, I can go there, you know, who think to themselves, mm -hmm. Okay, I don't believe in a God who pulls strings. I think about like 9-11. I mean, I think about the number of stories yeah. who, of people who called in sick that day and weren't in the Twin Towers or didn't, not in the Pentagon or, you know, or the people who were who shouldn't have been in the sense that they weren't normally there and, you know, things like that. And so, you know, it doesn't mean that God chose them mm -hmm. versus not others, you know, things like that. But at the same time, um, I think there are often people who are a little more flippant with, with that. I'm getting from Brad the, you've talked way too much, and we still have a chapter. Okay, can um, I tell you? Yeah, please. I actually review this chapter. Um, I'm going to next week. So if we don't get through Great. all of it, I'll take some of your questions, and we'll go into next week. Perfect. How's okay, that? great. So let's just keep talking. No. Um, okay, great. Well, thank get us, you. Get I, us started. I, How's that? Well, perfect. Uh, my apologies because I must have misunderstood what I was supposed to cover, which is not really um, a shock to anyone. Um, I do think so. This actually gives me a chance to finish up on chapter seven uh, of what I was alluding to earlier, which I do think is important in, um, in reminding ourselves, which is um, Tibbetts ends the chapter by saying this. Um, that we have to understand, um, understanding someone's actions is not the same as condoning them. And I think that is important, and it is important, an important reminder as we go along. Um, and I, I worried as I was thinking through this, I don't want to sound like the pastor who is saying, okay, withhold forgiveness. I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to remind us that um, if we if we need to have that appropriate space and healing before um, offering that forgiveness, that that's certainly okay. And then um, the second is be careful uh, to say that you empathize, uh, not to say that you empathize when you really cannot connect to the person's experience. And that is just such a sign of privilege. And the example he uses in the book is a, uh, I think it was a candidate for prime minister uh, of, of Canada where she was, um, in a very impoverished area and talking about disappointment, how she didn't make it to be a classical cellist. And here people can barely feed themselves. And it's like, okay, let's have some scale in, you know, in check here. And so, you know, again, as we talked about certainly this summer in the sacred conversations, you know, for those of us who come from places of, of real privilege, 
um, we have to be mindful about where our empathy begins and ends. And so um, I thought those were important reminders to, yeah. to include. So I'm, I'm glad that I got a little uh, breathing room on that one. Are there any closing thoughts before I offer a, a blessing and some words of gratitude? Just a, it's always good to go deeper in this conversation yeah. because it's really brought up some people that I really want to intentionally forgive um, that I've just kind of put to the side. Yeah, I do not mean this in a flippant way at all. The list each week grows longer. I know. Every time he brings something up or, or offers a new perspective, I think, ooh, yeah, I need to, I need to work on this. Yeah. yeah, which is good, but it, it does remind you yeah. of, of that. So you're in the hot seat next week. And, and we will start with, um, with chapter, chapter eight, eight Got it. and then eight, nine, and 10. So I'll Got it. Okay, that's pick up where... right ne- from here and we will do Perfect. it. So um, that will be fantastic. I do want to thank, um, as we draw to a conclusion, I want to thank um, Brad, our director of production, and Chelsea, our receptionist, for their behind the scenes work and making everything uh, magically happen. Um, I certainly want to thank my colleagues and friends, Sharon and Deb, for both your uh, vulnerability and your willingness to share. And we want to thank uh, you, those of you who have joined us um, in this uh, conversation and continue to join us. Um, whether you're reading or whether you're simply uh, tuning in, we're really grateful for um, having you alongside us. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, next week will be our fourth and penultimate session of the Fall Clergy Roundtable. And so this evening, as we take leave, I want to offer these words and thoughts from Dr. Maya Angelou as a blessing. You cannot forgive without loving. And I don't mean sentimentality. I don't mean mush. I mean having enough courage to stand up and say, I forgive. I'm finished with it. And so may those words bless and surround your heart as you do your own work. And we hope that you will join us next Wednesday at five as we continue this journey. Thanks again.